Hello, everybody, and hey, welcome. Power things. Oh, we're hearing a bit of echo, Mitch. Uh, I think. That could be me. Yeah, definitely hearing some echo. Uh, are you still hearing it? Yeah. <laughs> Why is that thing still playing? Yeah. Have you got another tab open, maybe? No. Why or it? Jeffrey or Karen? Maybe have a tab open playing with yeah. YouTube. Anyway, regardless, while well, you guys figure that out, hello everybody and hey. welcome to this live stream where we're going to be talking about Scientology. The con is on how Scientology sells lies because that is such a big topic and it is so clear how Scientology uses lies. This echo is very distracting. This huge, huge interference, not just an echo, just a blast of sound. I don't know what that's coming from. Um, Maybe you could go I've around just and figure it out. It's Jeffrey. I've just removed yeah. Jeffrey and I've yeah. added him back in. Jeffrey, I think you have a tab. He's got open a tab open. The YouTube video. So I've just taken you out for a second while you figure it out. Um, cool. Well, off to a rocky start. How's it going, Karen? <laughs> oh, it's going great. Karen, <laughs> doing fabulous. Uh -huh. Jeffrey. Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah, good. Doing, doing great. Hey. Welcome. Yeah. So. The con is on how Scientology sells lies, right? Scientology uses lies to deceive and recruit people into Scientology. And so we're going to be looking at some of the big lies that Scientology so often uses to lure people in and then keep them in. And so I thought a good way to maybe start this was looking at, obviously, I worked in Division 6, which is the public division of Scientology, right? Which is getting new people in. So I thought that would be a good place to start. Um, so a key, an example I always use of a lie and how Scientology cons people from the get go. The moment I first walked into a Scientology org, um, I was skeptical. I'd heard all of the stories of disconnection, all this sort of stuff. And I said, I asked, what's this disconnection thing? And the answer I was given, which is the same answer I would then give when I was on staff was, well, look, disconnection is something that's massively misinterpreted. We would never force families to disconnect from each other. You know, it's a personal choice. An example would be if you're in school and there's a bully that's, you know, being mean to you or whatever, you would naturally distance yourself from that person. You know, you would naturally want to not talk to them and not have them in your life. So you're disconnecting from them. That's all disconnection is. Uh, it's just been blown out of proportion in the media. We would never force someone to, to break a family apart. And as we all know, that is a lie. And that's one of the first things that a lot of people will hear in Scientology. Well Thought. spoken, Alex. Wow. Yeah. Even even they even had the nerve though their other sign they had the nerve to have their spokesman go on CNN and say, There is no such thing as disconnection. Tommy Davis, I wish we could put the clip. <laughs> <laughs> we could get it up, I'm sure. I would have to try and find it, but uh yeah. I mean, from the get-go, Mitch. It, you like it's you actually a video. Uh, there's YouTube called "There Is No Such Thing as Disconnection in Scientology," and there's just a clip of that. Anyway, Mitch. Yes. Were you you ready to say something? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly. I can say a lot. The thing is, there is this. Uh, yes, absolutely. There's one aspect of uh, new people. Division six, the public division, is all about getting new people in. And they have actually what they call a production line because everything in Scientology that is intended, designed to produce something is referred to as a production line. And the f primary production line for getting new people in is called the testing line. I'm sure you've all heard about um, uh, personality tests. They have this fake thing called the Oxford Capacity Analysis Test, which is just like, um, you know, it has the word it has the word Oxford in it, plus the word analysis, plus the word capacity, and you put them all together into kind of this sciencey word salad, and you come up with these fake tests. And what they do is, so it goes like this: it starts out on the street, right, I, uh, and and with what they call body routers. Right, uh, and so then those people were supposed to hand out tickets, hand out tests, get people in, drag people in, bring people in. I mean, I, I made a film about how this entire line works, so I know it really, really well. So then the body routers are supposed to get these new public in, and then they go to what's called the test center in the 
building. And then in some cases, they'll have test centers that are even separate from the organization. And then the idea, yes, Alex? Uh, we've got pictures of body robbers while we're Oh, yeah, yeah, let's take a look at that. Who, do you, what you've got yeah, because you are, Alex, you were intimately involved in the three card Monty known as Scientology. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, we have, uh, like, I'm just, I've just Googled body routers here. We call them routers in the UK rather than routers. Yeah, we call them routers, but, but it doesn't uh, matter. But here, body routers. So you say root to infinity and we say route yes, to infinity. Yeah. Right? So here we can there see they some are. Scientologists huh. handing out leaflets, you know, come and get a free personality test. They look so happy. Yeah, especially these guys. <laughs> yeah, they look really thrilled. <laughs> but yeah, oh, so yeah. you know, we would always yeah, when we have we had the test center in London, so we would always have, you know, one or two people outside giving out flyers saying, Hey, do you want to come in for a stress test or for a personality test or come and watch a free film? And it would be the Dianetics info uh, displays. And uh, that from that point, I would take over and try and sell them the book. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, the body writers. Uh, it, it, yeah, and they basically, they do a pretty good job of gaslighting the public. I mean, at least they're trained to gaslight the public. I can tell you that in the film I made, which is called, um, what is it called? I'm so happy I'm starting to forget. This is one of the longer names it's called. Oh, it's called The Use of Testing. Uh, the use of the e-meter in testing and something else, right? And so there's a scene, uh, in, not at the beginning of the film, but there's a scene where there's a body router out on the street. It's actually not the body router. It's the chief registrar, the chief salesperson. But because business is slow, Hubbard wants to teach staff that when business is slow, it doesn't matter what your job is. You get off your butt and you go out and you get people in here because that's what we're all about. And they referred to this as elastic team tactics. You probably heard that term, right, Alex? It's like yeah. Every, and it means and and the line is elastic team tactics go with the flow. So when uh, when the chief registrar goes out into the street, she's she's in the company of a commentator who is interviewing her. He's interviews everybody. And she stops at a bus stop and she says, oh, this will do well. Every people mob off the bus. She stops a guy who's in a big hurry. And she says, um, she goes to hand him an invitation to come take an OC, a personality test. And he says, oh, I'm, he brushes her up. I don't have time. I'm in a hurry. I'm late. And she literally body blocks him. She stands in front of him and she says, have you ever wondered why you're always so late? Well, he never said he's always so late. She says, have you ever wondered why you're always so late? And this piques his interest. And he's like, he looks at her and she said, why don't you come on in and we'll find out. So it's, this is the kind of psychological play that's used to like hook people in, right? And so then we see an old woman, an elderly woman uh, who's taken a test and she's now what they call routed or in England, what they call rooted to what's called a test evaluator. And now the test evaluator is going to go over her personality test with her. Fascinating. It's an elderly woman and her name is Mrs. Brown. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Mrs. Mm -hmm. Brown, as in Rosemary Brown, as in, as in Mike Brown's mom. Like for wow. some weird yeah. reason, this elderly woman, her name is Mrs. Brown, right? Which I, I, I was I, thinking... Oh, sorry, Mitch. I was thinking of the song, Mrs. Brown, You've Got Brown, a Lovely got Daughter. A lovely daughter. Isn't that Herman Hermits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe right. Hubbard was, he might have been a Herman's Hermits fan. Could have been. I, I'm, sorry, I heard he liked, to, you know. uh, he liked to hum Henry VIII. Quick I little am, thing. I, I, I sent yeah. a message to someone, but it said a posted, Alex posted it instead of me. Now, yeah, what, it can, it, what on earth a, is that? That's a background StreamYard thing that... Um, it's to do with being admins and stuff when you post you have to select your channel but sometimes it doesn't let you do it so if you click mm -hmm. on you know when you're typing a post on the left there's like a little icon you can click on it and make sure it comes from your account but sometimes it doesn't work i see well i have to yeah i did we'll quite figure get it out that, but we'll figure yeah okay yeah. listen i just want to say before we go on i think for some really weird reason uh, you guys have been bleeding subscribers like i have been for no reason i don't know why but it's just like, you know, and okay, I'm, I'll admit, maybe it's just me, I'm boring and people are running away in droves.
but it might have to do with other goings on. It might have to do with YouTube. So if you could just take a minute and subscribe, subscribe to each of our channels and or make sure that you are yeah. subscribed, it would be really appreciated. Absolutely. We're, we're streaming on all of our channels um, and there should be links in the description. If they're not, uh, Surviving Scientology is Karen, then Jeffrey is Scientology Money Project, and then you've got Mitch Brisker and myself, Posse Alex. We're streaming all of them. So, yeah, give us a like and a subscribe. And sometimes people get unsubscribed, you know, automatically by YouTube. It's been doing that a lot as well. So just double check. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, but you know, is, I, I mean, I, I've, I, since I've been losing the last couple of days, it's like I'm looking at this going, what? I mean, you know, that's not the end of the world. It's like whatever. No, my uh, subs are straight up and vertical. <laughs> but You're in power. You can, but as yeah, you can but that's see, because, I, Jeffrey, come on, look yeah. at your backdrop. Hey, you know, this is a killer like, backdrop. Yeah, you're like I'm, advertising for Scientology. They're like, no, I mean, I mean, Someone no, asked this question, that, modern dancer question, Jeffrey, why are you using yeah, that Yeah, Jeffrey, backdrop? go ahead. Okay. Why are you using that? I, I want to explain. Um, well, one, I'm artistic. And two, no one's ever done it before. No, I think it's and three. Great. I wanted to, it's universally recognized. And I wanted uh, people to know that I'm live streaming, live, podcasting live from outside Pack Base. On Fa so Fountain you Avenue. You're on Docs, Fountain Avenue, right? I'm on Fountain Avenue. It's that right. sense that I'm podcasting live. And so if you see German attack dog, German shepherd attack dog, security guards or LAPD come and get me, you'll know. No, but it's, it's, it seemed like such a, when I was thinking of a background, I thought one that's never been used. This is a lot of fun to just, I mean, Alex yeah. Gibney opened his documentary with this going clear. Yeah, so I think I'm terrific. I, th I think I'm going to do the one taken across the street from Scientology Media Productions. Well, if we, yeah, you should, Mitch. I think if we started using Scientology, <laughs> yeah, I think if we all did that, props, I think if we all up. did that, like Alex, do the Linden Org, I'll do SMP, you do <laughs> PAC, and we'll be like, do, do, do our local orgs. Do, Karen can do Celebrity Center. You know, Karen yeah. was for a while. Just good to go off topic here. She was senior case supervisor at Celebrity Center. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. yes, my girl. That's my girl. What yeah. happened? Ray Midoff needed to. He was, he was needed because Hubbard was very, very ill, comatose. And so they needed to rush David Mayo to, which David Mayo saved his life. But to replace David Mayo, Ray Midoff went to Clearwater. But Ray could not be given up for free. <laughs> So I was the coin. They talk about coin <laughs> trades like you. <laughs> and I was sent to Celebrity Center because I had married Heber and we were living apart. I was in, he couldn't leave LA. I couldn't leave Clearwater. So that was the trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was there. Yeah. So for yeah, about a year and a half, I was senior CS Celebrity Center. Mm -hmm. That actually links to Are you into, scratching your chin, coin. Alex, or do you need to talk? I was putting my finger I up. I couldn't tell. You're like, I uh, had a point. I had a point. So that that's another con, actually, that just reminded me of a very common lie that people come across that Scientology tell you. When when they try and recruit you onto staff to work for the church, they will always try and, you know, tell you anything that will please you. You know, for me, I was a student and I wanted to go and do law and I was interested in the legal system. And so they said, well, look, why don't you join staff and we'll post you in the legal section in OSA because we've got tons of court cases, you know, so you can get some legal experience working right. on real life court cases. Yeah. And I was like, OK, great. The moment I signed my contract, I was posted in Division six selling books completely opposite <laughs> to what I wanted to do. And um, I ended up not going down the law route anyway with my career. But it's something that so many people experience is a, it's a con and a lie just to get you to sign on the paper and then once you're in the contract right. then that you're, you're right. all theirs well yeah they'll say alex there's great opportunities to pursue law in scientology which is true yeah right <laughs> but they just they're they certainly not say. short of lawsuits <laughs> yeah yeah plenty of opportunities i have to say karen you mentioned trades and in this film that i did about the testing line it has a sports motif the guy doing the interviewing is like a sportscaster in a, you know, like the wide world of sports. And the first person he talks to, who is the executive director at the test center, which is separate from the organization, from the, the enterprise, Scientology enterprise, whatever that is, what do you call it, whatever, uh, 
he, he says, hey, I haven't seen you since Flag. And the guy says, yes, since then I went to, I got traded for like a tech sec and a blah, blah. And like, they refer to it like it's sports teams, right? So it, they really do, like, that's just a thing in Scientology, this trading thing, like, you know, they want you to go from one organization to another, but you have to get replaced. But no, we want two people for you because you're so valuable. It's a whole thing that they do. Really the not. language used is a little bit demeaning, like bodies in the shop, raw yeah. meat, how yeah. many raw meat? So yeah. a prospective client is talked in, in, a, in, the, in a language as a piece of raw meat. Raw meat means you're a wog. Wog means you're not a Scientologist. Yeah. Well, it means you're, you're, you're less than, you're barely human. Mm. Yeah. yeah. PTS for life here. Jeff just had a really good uh, comment. He said, one big con line is that Scientology is an applied religious philosophy to try and connect itself as a religious group instead of a giant real estate scam. Good job. <laughs> yeah, well, good job, Jeff. Perfectly spoken. Yeah. Well, I mean, if yeah. you believe... If, if you believe in religion as a real estate portfolio, I mean, they worship real estate. Yeah, a lot of people do. Some people, some people worship their wine collection, right, Jeff? Yeah, I wanted to, you know, um, Alex sold books. I wanted to get into some of the Scientology contract stuff about how the lies are actually sold. Yes. Okay. Yeah, are, are we ready to go there? And yep. for a comment. Okay. Yeah, we well, can. I mean, we, we didn't finish the whole well, the Mitch, testing. Mi oh, no, no, Mitch, finish. Yeah, please. Yeah, we were in the middle of the testing line. So Mrs. Brown yeah, is with sorry. the test evaluator. And the test evaluator, now they have a playbook of the way they interpret these, uh, these personality tests. So she looks at her results and she says, Mrs. Brown, it says here, it says here that you're accident prone. And the woman gets a little introverted and she's kind of thinking about that. You know, she's an elderly woman. She may have trouble with her balance or whatever. And But this, this test evaluator is reading this off a script. This result means tell this person they're accident prone. And the, this, it really caught, catches this woman off guard because she's like, hmm, maybe I am. Then the test evaluator says, do you sometimes try to handle, to take on more than you can handle? So there's always this evaluation, like the guy in the street in the film, it was like, are you, would you like to find out why you're so busy? And, and the elderly woman is, would you, do you sometimes take on more than you can handle? So it's this idea of shoving them into what they call a ruin. And you know, she pulls out her credit card and right on camera and buys a course. Then the camera dollies and there's a, a handsome young man who happened to be played by the actor, David Barrett, who, I mean, sorry, uh, Barrett Oliver, uh, my mind. It was played by Bird Oliver anyway, and the and the the test evaluator is saying, well, you know, maybe the the girls wouldn't say that if you know you didn't blah blah. Makes a very evaluative statement about his relationship with women. He pulls out his credit card and he buys a, a course. So and then it goes on from there. Then when they they finish their service, whether they get auditing or whatever, then they're given this test again, and the test is used to show them that they've actually made improvement. So at that point, they're sent, put on this hamster wheel, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And a lot of people fall off, but enough stay. So that Scientology, in addition to its real estate holdings, uh, has managed to you know amass a few billion dollars. Anyway, there's yeah. the testing line, and it's one of the major cons. Now, Mitch, you, you mentioned uh, uh, it, it sounds almost like a, a, a psychic cold reading. Like yeah, I could say exactly, to you, exactly. I could say to you, Mitch. Um, I sense you're under a lot of tension these days. I sense you're you're uneasy about something going on in your life, and there's a little bit of stress and rush, and maybe your thoughts right. are a little bit scattered. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, maybe there's a woman involved. Yeah. I mean, this is like all nine out of ten stuff, right? Yeah, and then Alex, <laughs> Alex, I have a clear sense that you know he's hiding behind his glasses. <laughs> it's all this kind of suggestive language, isn't it? That's exactly yeah. what it's yeah. based on. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. let's get let's get now, into oh, Jeffrey. Go, just before Jeffrey starts his contracts, yes, can sir. I throw up one hundred percent lie? In order to extract tens of thousands of dollars for people to get not to jettison attached spirits, they tell. 
the lie is you will be cause over matter, energy, space, and time. And who talks like that? What? I'll be cause over time? I'll be cause over matter? Anything material? These are very provocative, teasing, luring in promises. And if you look at tens of thousands of people who did this level supposedly to be cause over matter, energy, space, and time. They're alcoholic, they're, <laughs> they're into violence, they're, <laughs> they have complete compulsions and so on. So there's a lie that extorts gazillions of dollars to be cause. And then, and then when you do solo knots, you're supposed to be cause over life. Well, what does that actually mean? Cause over life? Okay, Jeffrey, you go. Yeah, Mitch, did you have a comment? No. Um, uh, ca I, I was thinking, life. I was thinking, um, well, Thought? we'll get back. Well, let me think about cause over life and I'll get back to it. But okay. yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, if you look at Scientologies, and this leads into what you want to talk about, Jeffrey. This, I'll do a segue here. If you look at Scientology's main landing page, Scientology.org, it says on there, Scientology has answers to life's biggest questions. Who am I? Where am I going? Why am I here? Okay, so this stuff is the stuff that you go, um, you turn around and you run away. When anybody presents you with that, you go, oh, I, I know what you're trying to do here. Uh, and so that, that, those lines, those actual lines, are in a film called Orientation, which was the beginning of the contracts that Jeffrey's talking about. That Hubbard had this idea uh, to, to a way to prevent lawsuits. He said, you know what? People have sued us because they said, we got involved in Scientology and they told us it was a religion and they made promises and then we found out it wasn't a religion and it was just a bunch of hooey. And they left and they sued. You know, one girl famously said they promised to fix her eyesight and, and she still needed glasses. That was the big lawsuit in Portland, right? It was just over something silly like that. And they lost millions and millions of dollars on that. Uh, so Hubbard had this great idea. He said, what if I make a film that shows, that implies that Scientology is religious in nature, and then after the film's done, we have the people watching it sign an affidavit. And the affidavit says, I saw the film, I understand what I'm getting into, and then if somebody ever sues us for that, then I can simply, we can, the church lawyers can take the affidavit into court, they can show it to the judge, and it'll be immediately thrown out. He referred to this as, this purpose of the film as, to forestall litigation. And then to make the whole thing look legit, he said, and to help a new person get around in the organization. Hmm. So, uh, you know, that, that was, that, that's the beginning of these affidavits that the people saw. Mm -hmm. And again, that in itself is a con, right? That just shows totally that, that the whole, like, you know, you're pitched mm -hmm. as a staff member that's newly recruited, that this is orientation, it's helping you understand how it all works and where you are and what the org, how the org operates and all of this, you know, and that's the purpose of the film. But you just described David right. Scavage saying, no, that's the secondary aim. The main aim is a legal one. That's a lie. That's a con. Yeah, yeah, it was Hubbard. It was actually Hubbard who, who or Hubbard, described. Completely yeah. opposite yeah. to what it actually is meant for. Well, there was, he wanted it to be, to be ostensibly to help the person, but covertly uh, so that they wouldn't be able to sue on the grounds of, I didn't know what I was getting into. Yeah. Also, OCA, they're using Oxford capacity, yeah. nothing to do with the fabulous Oxford unit. But people are so, oh, Oxford, oh, it's an Oxford stress test. Yeah, I think they it, use yeah. <laughs> total. Yeah, <laughs> total yeah no, the language is amazing. I mean, I think it's more relevant to Oxford shoes than it is to Oxford <laughs> or, or, or fabric or something it got, who knows. But I have to tell you, there's some really profound religious concepts in the film orientation. It's actually kind of funny. I wish I could kept a script. I mean, I remember a lot of it in my head. And for people who are watching, this was originally the film that had the line, um, 
at the end that had the kicker was, uh, you can stand up right now and walk out of this theater and never mention Scientology again. If you, it would be a bad idea, but you can do it. You can also jump off a bridge or blow out your brains. Mm -hmm. But if you choose to stay, we will be very happy with you and you will be very happy with you because you will have proven that you are a friend of yours. It was loaded with, I mean, we changed that. We took out the blow out your brains, jump off a bridge thing because it was just like, it was just like a Intense. bad idea. Hmm. But Mitch, yeah, the version, the version I saw had that in it. That was Larry. Yeah, Anderson. it's still on. The, yeah, it's still on yeah. the internet. But the film was remade yeah. uh, with just it, voiceover talent. So it, that, it was it, scary, though. Yeah, it was really frightening. After yeah. years of Larry Anderson demanding they change it because they were using him, and he'd long since left the cult. They, did, he, Larry, demanded it over and over, and they still used him. Yeah, and then, well, and then it, according to Mitch, they then redid it and took. Oh out yeah, Larry. we we actually redid it not too long after Larry left because it was such a problem. So I I think he just Larry just didn't know that we'd redone it because you know it's Scientology nobody cares nobody's going to tell him, like they're not going to give anybody the courtesy. You know we redid it with a wonderful actor did the he did it as narration nobody was on camera, and he had a sort of a he was a from Britain he had British accent. Because I tell you, Scientology, David Muscov, they love British accents. It's like, you know, it's like if, if Andrew Gold had come to me, or Alex has a brilliant accent, they, they, they literally, they like youthful British accents. The guy we hired, he's uh, a wonderful actor. I've seen him act and do voiceover a lot. And his, he'd lived in America for so long that when he goes home to Britain, people are like, oh, you have an American accent. But to us, he sounded great. So we use him as a voice of orientation. Uh, but yeah, there's some other, let me just, there's one other great piece of uh, religious language where, where Hubbard wrote, wrote, he wrote, let me see, I'm, I'm trying to remember, he wrote, religion has meant peace for man. Man has believed far longer that he was a spirit than he was a piece of mud, right? And then what you're looking at is a, a kind of a goth-like character in a diaphanous robe with a long white beard. And he's gently holding a monkey. And he's placing the monkey onto the floor of a jungle. So it's this really weird kind of hypnotizing, brainwashing thing that says like, you know, maybe evolution is real, but it was God making it all happen. And we really are a religious movement and blah, blah, blah. So, it, you know, and then the body of the film just gets into the guy saying, you know, this is this and this is this and this is this. And, you know, helping. And then you have the end scene where where you get all that the crazy talk about Scientology. Yeah. You know, Mitch, I just want to add a, a story uh, before we go on. Uh, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, whenever, you know, you remember Jason McGay made his fabulous YouTube videos? Yeah, absolutely. Where he, where he, he roared, show yep. me a motherfucking clear. Well, yeah, right yeah, my, 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 yeah, I just went, my favorite quote was from Jason was, um, clear the planet at those prices, you couldn't clear Beverly Hills. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Oh, I love Jason. Um, no, but so I, I, I had met Jason a few times with lunch, but uh, around that, when he left, you know, because I'd been, everyone was hooking up well, old guard, never ends, indies, right. people who had left, former CRG. So Mark and Claire Headley and Jason McGay had a party, an SP party at Lake Pyramid uh, here in California, Southern California. Right. And I remember I, I went there and, and everyone was there. And I was uh, walking, and suddenly I see Larry Anderson. Wow. And it's like, you're the guy in the orientation film. Yeah. This, for me, was um, very much a revelation because it made uh, someone who was high-level, prominent, you know, celebrity in Scientology real. I'd already right. met Jason, and then Larry, he had left the day before. Wow. He spent, he had, he, he had just left the day before and he was there with his, his uh, wife and it was really quite something. He was such a nice guy. He was such a nice, decent, I, I know, I know Larry, I used to see him at Tori Christman's SP parties, but it was amazing. Right. But, but see, this is what's so great about SPT. We can tell stories. I never knew there was a Mitch Brisker directing uh, the film in which Larry Anderson was in. <laughs> so, so to me, it's always a pleasure to meet the real people, 
and to get to hear their stories yeah. once you you know once you come out from behind the facade. So, um, right. by the way, Larry never attested to clear. He was in, I think, 20 years or something, spent a million dollars. He never attested to clear because he said, I'm not clear. And he refused right. to do it. So, um, but the, le the legal stuff about how they sell lies, I'm going mm. to go on share. Are we ready? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So let me share the screen. And this, uh, again, is from the Scientology Money Project. Now, this is an article I did, and it covers one of Mitch's favorite topics, Scientology TV. Scientology TV's futile attempt to normalize Scientology deviance and lies. <laughs> and I started out with, this is kind of a fun old 1970s era. Uh, or an 80, it's an 84 book, rather. Um, so before we begin, I want to, to the audience uh, to notice that wall. Thank you. So let's just notice the wall. Isn't that a weird piece, Mitch? Yeah. Notice that wall. <laughs> that's it yeah. from a training routine, right? Yeah, yeah. That's from one of the okay. objective training routines. Yeah. Notice that wall. Thank you. Now, as we go down, I'm going to uh, just go through this. Let me get the screen down a little bit. When you go into Scientology, and I'm going to um, take this off just for a minute. Let, let me... Let me set it up here. Um, let me set it up, okay? I just did a piece on uh, Scientology billionaire Bob Duggan. Right. He spent $500 million to buy the rights for a drug from a Chinese pharmaceutical company. And then Bob immediately goes out to, to sell more shares, 476 million shares, the purpose of which is to repay him back his $500 million. And I'm going somewhere with this. Bob wants to eliminate his risk, his financial risk. So he spent 500 million out of his pocket, but he wants his company or his shareholders to pay it back. So the risk is gone. Which can, you explain, can you explain to the audience who Bob Duggan is in okay. relation to Scientology? B Bob Duggan is a billionaire. He's a long-term Scientologist, and um, he's donated over $400 million to the Church of Scientology in his lifetime. He made his money in big pharma. Uh, he, he invented a cancer medication, or his company, uh, Pharmacyclics, did, and they sold it to AbbVie for $21 billion. Bob's share was about 3.2, which he split with his wife, Trish. And so he's generated, uh, donated over 3.2 2 billion. So hoping that lightning will strike twice in pharma, uh, big pharma, uh, Bob locked up the rights to this uh, Chinese company's drug, uh, and it's just the rights. And then, but he's trying to raise the money to pay him back, so he eliminates his financial risk, okay, by using other people's money. To me, as an investor, that's bad faith. Any Wall I talked to one of my friends on Wall Street who said no Wall Streeter would take that deal with Bob. They wouldn't invest if he didn't have skin in the game. Grant Cardone does the same thing. Grant Cardone buys a building in his own name with his own money. Then he, in turn, sells it to Cardone Capitalist Company at a markup and takes a 1% finder's fee. So Grant buys a building, say, for $200 million. He puts 20% down sells it to a, his company, gets his down payment back. So he's eliminated his risk altogether. So when you get to the concept of that's called self-dealing, where you're telling a group of people that this is a good investment, but you're actually wanting to eliminate all of your risk, all of your financial right. and legal risk, right? right? That's what Scientology does. I'm going to show you why. So I preface it. Now, when we go on, when you go into Scientology, you're going to see uh, Mitch Brisker's orientation film, and that's for them to take you behind um, First Amendment religious protections. You have to agree that Scientology is religion. Now, this obscure document is called Statements by Staff Members, and it says, quote, the church, its board, and its management take no responsibility for statements or claims made by staff members regarding the workability of Dianetics spiritual healing technology or Scientology applied religious philosophy or any claims or promises made by made to public persons 
the public or to Scientologists, unquote. So what they've done there, to your point, Alex, or, or you know, you can say, as a staff member, you can say Scientology can help you with this. Mitch, what you said in the personality test, Scientology can help you with this. Mm -hmm. They find your ruin. Can Karen, you know, they say, hey, some auditing can help you with this. So, but legally, they're saying we take no responsibility whatsoever for what a Scientology reg or staff member has said. Mm -hmm. So that's right. that's mm -hmm. the lie. They mm -hmm. also say that L. Ron Hubbard never promised Scientologists anything. That right. the tech is just mm -hmm. his record of research. Mm -hmm. Now, this next thing I'm going to read, and it's worth listening to. This is from the Church of Scientology's own website. Do you see it? What will I get out of auditing? Mm. Okay. What it says, um, it, it describes auditing. You can pause it and read it, but I'm not going to go through it. Uh, but at the very bottom, the red arrow, it says, we are not making any claims for Dianetics or Scientology. When you have experienced it, it is you who will make the claims. Yeah. So Scientology mm -hmm. takes your $500,000, but they shift the burden onto you Mm. to a test and mm. below this next paragraph mm. the church right here mm. uh the church makes no guarantee of results as auditing is something which requires the active participation of the individual mm. auditing is not something done to an individual it is something done in which the individual is the active participant so mm. my point is that the church takes all the money promises nothing, and you sign a contract to that effect, refuses mm -hmm. to make any claims regarding the efficacy of Scientology. Mm -hmm. So Scientology shifts the burden for all claims made by Roland Hubbard onto its own staff members and parishioners. So basically, Scientology promises you everything, but legally promises you nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to attest that you've completed a level. That's why you have to make a success story. They say, hey, we're just here. This is a record of research. You have to experience it for yourself. You attest to OT1, OT2, OT3. You attest to going clear. We didn't do anything. We're just giving you. So that's the real lie is they'll take your money and promise you everything. But legally, you've signed off that you, you didn't rely on any promises. And, and if you uh, refuse to write a success story, you bounce back. You have no more chance to get yeah, to any yeah, other level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, no, Karen, somebody asked that. We were, I was on with Mitch the other day, mm -hmm. and someone asked what happens if you don't write a success story. What happens, <laughs> Karen? You are frozen in time. No more Scientology. Yeah. No more. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter if you had 50000 on account sitting there. They've got the money. And you can be declared SB for asking for a refund. So you're absolutely trapped. You write a success story. Well, if you don't, the viewpoint is something was missed. Go back and get more counseling at your dime. Use up more hours and go into a correction cycle. So people are conditioned. Write something down. Otherwise, I'll never. <laughs> oh I yeah, no, you just, yeah. and you and you learn the pattern of what to write. You have to mm -hmm. thank L. Ron Hubbard. Um, mm -hmm. You have to mention it as life changing, and if you're really watching your P's and Q's, you'll mention that David Miscavige is just the most awesome person in the world, and that'll keep you out of trouble. Well, people, I just, have, I just, uh, people have written to me from Free Winds saying, if they didn't put. Thank you. Thank you, David Miscavige, and glorify him. Their success story of what they did is kicked back. They must yeah. now go back and yeah. include David Miscavige and L. Ron Hubbard in the success story. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, 100%. I, I, I just have to mention that the language that you read off, Jeffrey, that said, we uh Dianetics Scientology, we make don't make claims. It is you who'll make the claims. That's yes. word for word from the orientation film. That's that's yeah, it, a line that Hubbard wrote in the orientation film. You mentioned I'm glad you mentioned that because L. Ron Hubbard, he said that one of the successful he wrote this in 1964. He wrote three things. He wrote the successful actions have been to 
get people to sign waivers where they give up their legal rights. And so they formalize it. The, the, the film interested me, uh, you know, before I met you, I was aware of this, that they want to pull, they want to make the film so that you signed it and said, I, I, I have read, I've seen the film orientation and I agree that Scientology is a religion. And by you agreeing right. that it's a religion, you give your consent to be governed by Scientology. Right. In fact, mm -hmm. if you don't see orientation and sign that you agree Scientology is religion, you stop, you don't go anymore, you don't get any auditing. Right. So the first thing they're going to do is pull you behind their First Amendment religious protections. Right. You know what's fascinating Which, about that is in the United Kingdom, there is no First Amendment religious protection. It's, it's mm -hmm. a completely different legal system. But the contracts are exactly the same. You know, I had to sign a contract that says I agree Scientology is a religion, but it doesn't have the same effect here. There's no such thing, for example, as pe a priest penitent privilege in the United Kingdom. That's not a thing in law. Mm -hmm. There is no protection for confessionals and that sort of thing in law. Um, but it's exactly the same contract in the U.S., you know, but it doesn't give the same protections here. <laughs> they haven't adapted the contract, which you would think they would, but they can't adapt the contract because the the legal system here doesn't allow for that protection like it does in the States. Mm. Well, here, I mean, here it's very important. And, and so Hubbard wanted that film, as Mitch said, created so you could see the bookstore. And, you know, the film is in, in some ways, it, it's kind of... Uh, interesting how they take you through the bookstore mitch i like the part where uh larry's talking to the 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 uh the woman at the bookstore and she's saying oh albert and hubbard's books always sell out they're so hard to keep in stock and yeah, yeah they're very popular she yeah she points out this bundle of uh well you should start with these they're very popular yeah, yeah, yeah. She does this whole number. That's and then Nor Norman Starkey makes an appearance in the film. Yeah, yeah. That all and, got read on a rewrite. Yeah, he and, and, he he takes us through uh, Hubbard's early days as a adventurer and a writer and a yeah. bon vivant well, yeah. pilot and Boy Scout and all this crazy stuff. Yeah, I like how Norman says, "Mr. Hubbard was fully professional in twenty-seven fields." Yeah, yeah. yeah. For us, <laughs> really good. <laughs> that's really good. I think, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, we did that at the, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. We did that at the uh, Life Exhibition at the HGB. We actually shot that in the Life ex Exhibition. And wh while yeah. we were in the middle of shooting, all of a sudden I got a call on my cell phone from Miscavige. It wasn't even like his secretary saying, please hold for David Miscavige. It was like, and he was panting and breathless. And he said, I just heard you were at the HGB. Yeah, I'm at the HGB. He said, can you go up to the 12th floor and interview Heber? I need it for a court case. So, you know, uh, Heber Gentsch at that point was president of the church and he yeah. needed to, some kind of a, a statement from him to be shown at court. And so he just shut yeah. down an entire shoot. Uh, you know, it was just crazy. He said, go up to the 12th floor right now. I'll pay you $3,000. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I, and you can't say no, but I'm like, I'm already being paid to be here. It was just really weird. Like, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, whatever. It was just a funny story that yeah. I, I forgot about that. I associate that with Norman because it's, you know. He was know. my former husband. He yeah, right. Yeah. And the father of my son. Yeah. That's another yeah. whole story. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, can I go through the four contracts very quickly? Yeah, please. For the yes. audience, we have Linda mm -hmm. Sata. Okay, so uh, this again is from my blog. I'll put it in the show notes. These are the four contracts. And uh, the first one that Mitch referred to is called, quote, attesta attest attestation, attestation of religious belief. Thank you. Attestation of religious belief regarding the Scientology mm -hmm. religious film called Orientation. And, and I put it on my blog, and it's basically giving your consent to be governed and you you know it now the second contract is called religious services enrollment application agreement and general release and a point i've made over and over is that uh in america consent belongs to the individual right so you have to give your consent to be governed by a religion and this is right. why i made the point that when you resign from scientology you should write them a letter ias all the orgs you've been in saying i withdraw my consent to be governed 
by the ecclesiastical rules and laws. So you withdraw your consent. So when you go and you give them your consent, and it is legally binding, and and this also you uh, you abandon. If you look at point B, can you see point B on your screens? Um, uh, free says, senior project has just said question attestation i need a word clear attestation just means you are attesting you're saying yes i i've read this i agree with this and it's it's my opinion is that would you agree with that kind of definition jeffrey oh yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah right on mm -hmm. now can you see point b on this or do i need to make it larger if this you make it bigger that would be great it's quite small okay let me make it larger can you see it now perfect okay now this is a very important, um, <laughs> let me go back. Let me go. Point B, here's what the church wants you to do. Quote, the abandonment, surrender, waiver, and relinquishment to which I refer in the immediately preceding sub paragraph is unconditional and irrevocable. Now, what you give up in point A, you freely give your consent to be bound uh, by the discipline, faith, internal organization. So this is the legal thing which means you uh, forever, quote, forever abandon, surrender, waive, and relinquish your right to sue or otherwise seek legal recourse with respect to any dispute, claim or controversy against the church, all other Scientology churches, all other organizations. So basically what you're doing is you're agreeing not to sue the church ever, either that your heirs, assigns, families, anybody. So for a church that preaches freedom, what they want to do at first is strip you of your civil and legal rights to sue them. And you agree to, to go into binding arbitration, uh, uh, which is subject all things to the international justice chief. So this is how they're selling lies. Then uh, on your folders, your pre-clear folders, where it's a written record of all your spiritual progress or lack thereof, you agree that you don't own them, that the church owns them in perpetuity. You can never see them, look at them, read them, or anything. So you don't get to know what's going on on your folders. And uh, Karen, uh, just for a minute, I'll pause before we go to the fourth contract. Religious, the PC folders, because mm -hmm. you, you were a class 12 CS, what do they contain? Why don't they want pre-clears to look at their folders? Why can't they have them or look at them? Well, now and again, there's some very derogatory stuff written. For example, really, there's at least 159 people, I listed them all, that have access to look at your folder when you're in. All of CMO can call for your folder. RTC can call for your folder. Every FES and another FES, every FES has looked at your folder. Also, Int has looked at your. Also, Int Legal has looked at your folder. Also, Int Intelligence has looked at your folder to time track you. We, I actually calculated how many people are senior CS. They would call for the folders, and your folders are read and discussed. Now, the derogatory comments might be: This is a no case gain. Would not be surprised if he is. You fill in the dots. These are just commentaries, and of course, they don't want your full. You know, you don't want to be caved in by looking at just loose tongue, sloppy comments in the folder. But I wanted to yeah. tell you, since I worked at Office of Special Affairs for five and a half years, I would just want to throw in a point. When Christopherson won a judgment of. $30 million in Portland, Oregon, the church got paralyzed with fear of how law courts and judges are normally hostile to, they, they understand fair game and stuff. They, they got immobilized with fear. And that's the very start and origin point of more and more lawyers writing more and more contracts and right. adding more paragraphs. Now, every time there's another lawsuit, and look at present time, Lear suit, they do a complete threat. And how can this be? We thought we bulletproofed ourselves against lawsuits. Every additional lawsuit adds more and more refining and more and more paragraphs 
And now you must sign one inch, one and a half inch thick. Jeffrey's showing, showing you some of the contracts, but every lawsuit causes yet more <laughs> legal loopholes to be sewn up so that you cannot sue. Right. They can't believe yeah. it when there's another lawsuit and another lawsuit and right. another well, lawsuit. They I, I, thought they were bulletproof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I, I would just like to add to that, Karen, is that when the orientation film was done, which was the beginning of the these affidavits, these contracts you have to sign, it was thought that that was the end of it. And then mm. there was, what is it? There's, in addition to the orientation, how many, there's a total of three or four, Jeffrey? The, well, there, there's four more. Let me just show you the last one. Uh, the last contract, and let me uh, enlarge it here. The last contract is what I call the kidnap contract is mm. how uh, Lisa McPherson right. died horrendously. It basically says if you have a psychiatric episode or what they call a psych break, that right. you do not want uh, you do not want to be treated psychiatrically because you don't believe as a matter of faith in psyche and uh, psychiatry. So you expect the members of your religion to come and take you out of a psychiatric facility, as happened with Lisa McPherson. She had a psychotic episode. She got she had a, a small uh, fender bender there in Clearwater, jumped out of her car, stripped naked, and said she needed help in the middle of the day. Hmm. So the ambulance came and took her, and they were going to put her into a a, a Baker Act, you know, a, a three-day, 72-hour psychiatric evaluation. But the church came with this contract, pulled her out of it, and put her in what's called the introspection rundown. And, and Karen, can you explain what the introspection rundown is and why it can be of, uh, the duration can go on and on? Yeah. Tw what is the introspection rundown? Okay. And 27 days later, Lisa McPherson was dead. They took her out of Morton Plant, one of the top 10 hospitals in all of Florida, and believed that they knew. All right, to tell you what the introspection rundown is, let me tell you a small little anecdote. On the ship with we lived with L. Ron Hubbard, a guy called Bruce Welch went crazy. He had a meltdown, a psychiatric episode. And he went to the galley. The galley is what you, on a ship, the kitchen is called galley. And he got a carving knife. And he started running down the corridors. Ships have corridors with cabins each side. And he said he was going to kill L. Ron Hubbard and stab him. He actually named 133 times or whatever. But he was raving in a full-blown psychotic break. This is the origin of introspection right now. Poor Mike Rinder, he arrived, I think he was 18 years old. He was made to bodyguard Bruce Welch outside the cabin. Ship personnel, he old members, jumped on Bruce Welch, locked him in a cabin, barred, and he. they say, a madman has the strength of 10 ordinary men. Bruce Welch was, the bunk beds were iron. And with his extra adrenaline of his insanity, he was bending the iron in the cabin. So all the execs of the ship wanted Bruce Welch thrown off the ship pronto. Next port, get rid of this madman. And Hubbard said, no, 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 no. We claim we are the masters of the human mind. If we get rid of him, he'll just end up, in, he was an American, Bruce Welch, he'll end up in uh, psychiatry. So we have to cure him. So that was the birth of the introspection rundown. Hubbard and Bruce Welch became pen friends. And Hubbard wrote that Bruce Welch had to be in complete isolation in this cabin. No one was talk to him. Food must be just put through a slot on no speaking. Absolute total isolation. This this all became the introspection run. And they talked and they, you know, Hubbard's first question is: just before you wanted to kill me with the carving knife, what happened? What triggered you to go to the galley and get the, <laughs> the knife? 
it's electrifying to read this whole, all the flag auditors had to study this for blood because it's kind of unusual to pen friend someone who wants to stab you 133 times. <laughs> anyway, Hubbard took this incident and made it into a rundown. And actually, most of it was made into L11, which is absolutely crazy when you look at it. Because you're not a Bruce Welch. You're not grabbing a carving knife to go stabbing people. But you pay L11 to do most of the procedure done on Bruce Welch. What evil purpose do you have is the major listing question. The evil, you're evil. Well, Bruce Welch did have a meltdown and was being evil in as much as he wanted a homicidal act. But they sell L11 for tens of thousands of dollars as if these people had evil like Bruce Welch. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think this is what this is how it kind of ties into the theme, right? Of of it of, of Scientology being a con and selling the lies is that Scientology presents itself as something that is helpful and beneficial to you, not just as a human, but on a spiritual level. This is going to cure you. It's going to make you a better have give you a better existence in life. But in actual fact, it's not helpful. You know, if you're having a, a mental breakdown or a psychotic episode or something, what you need in that moment in time is care and compassion, yes. sometimes yes. medical interference, yes. right? Yes. Not someone asking you to write up your crimes and asking you what evil intentions you have. That is not going to help that person. But Scientology tells you that that is what's going to help you. It's a complete opposite right. of, of what it promises, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. what's terrible about introspection burndown is you're cut off from the world. No one can talk to you. As Lisa McPherson went more and more crazy, throwing her feces on the wall and just talking about God and she was God and God was in her. And as she was being more and more crazy, she ex made herself more and more divine in language. No one said a word instead of a kind word and maybe even a foot massage or something to just comfort her, they had her in complete and utter isolation. Yeah, That's a, that's a cruelty. And of course, 27, year, 27 days later, she was dead. So the introspection yeah. rundown is a summary of what Hubbard did with Bruce Welch to answer. Oh. Long-winded yeah. answer to your question. Did I answer yeah. your but this question, is what Jeff? the this is what the contract's about, right? This is giving you permission, giving the yeah. church permission to enforce this on you, right, Jeffrey? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to it. Specifically, what it does is you give the church permission to kidnap you and and lock you up in what's called the introspection rundown, and it can run up it can run through indefinite duration. And again, I'll post this in my notes, but basically, uh, it's at the discretion. So. If you have an event, they don't want you running out on the street screaming. They can actually physically take you into custody and lock you in a hotel room at Flag or wherever. Mm -hmm. There used to be babysitting houses where they would do this. There were some in the San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. But so they take away. You give them your consent to have this done. Now, in this bolded text, it says, quote, I have carefully read this contract and fully understand its contents and consequences. I also understand that I am not eligible for spiritual assistance unless I sign this contract, unquote. So unless you sign it, you're not going to get any auditing. Now let's go back and do quote. While it is unlikely that I will ever be in a condition where psychiatric intervention may be deemed an option, I herewith reaffirm that in such an event, I wish to receive only Scientology spiritual assistance, including, but not limited to, the introspection rundown, and that this choice is an independent exercise of my own free will. I fully understand that by signing below, I am forever giving up my right to sue the church, its staff, and any of the releases named in the general release I signed for any injury or damage suffered in any way connected with Scientology, religious services, or spiritual assistance, unquote. So you release the church for any damages up to and including death. So post Lisa McPherson, and these, these are in other contracts. For example, if you 
were doing auditing at the Detroit org during the winter and you slipped and fell and broke your knee on the steps of the org, you've hold them harmless for anything that happens to you up to and including death. So basically Scientology wants all the money, but they shift all the burden and all the risk onto you. And Bob Duggan has done the same thing with his investors as is Grant Cardone. So there's this massive, we want all the money and yet we want none of the liability or risk it's on you. So up to and including death, that's how profoundly the lie is. They'll sell you spiritual freedom, uh -huh. but if you die, harm, get injured, go insane, go bankrupt, disconnected from your family, you agree to never sue them and hold them harmless for anything. That's why what was interesting in um, one of the lawsuits, and I don't remember which one, uh, the appeals court, Ninth Circuit here in California, said to a Scientology lawyer, so the judge said, um, one of the three judges said, so if I went into Scientology in the 1980s and I experimented for a month or two and then left, and then 20 years later I was hit by a truck owned by the Church of Scientology, would these contracts still be binding upon me? And the church lawyer said, yes, we take that position that would be. So you're, the, the church wants to say, once you sign these contracts for the rest of your life, anything having to do with Scientology, you can't sue. And of course, the uh, the Ninth Circuit said, no, that we're not going to do that. So mm -hmm. that's that's interesting, but that's how they sell you lies. So the the, the lie is in the contract. The lie is in their advertising. You know, Mitch has talked about the taglines of freedom. Uh, everything that, that they put into their films about freedom, spiritual freedom, improve. What is it? What was it we talked about, Mitch, in the film? Improve your, improve your uh, city or improve yourself, improve oh, your city. Oh, the, the tagline that was uh, uh, change your city, change the world. Yeah. So they, they, yeah, they have all the, yeah. the marketing and advertising, but the reality is in the contracts. Right. And that's why right. we see um, Jane Joe's locked up and they want to, Valerie, they want to put them all into binding arbitration. So right. they're not selling you freedom. They're stripping you of your legal rights. And then when you see the dirty back end, they want to put you, silence you by locking you in an arbitration. Mm -hmm. PTS for life here said nothing screams religion like a lengthy contract. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, which, right. Yeah, on, you know, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, Scientology is very fixated on confession. Uh, the, the, every Scientologist has interacted with the organization in the form of a con some kind of confession, whether it's a, a security check, which is a straight-up interrogation, or whether it's a confessional, which is something you're more likely to say, uh, you're forgiven at the end and gaslight you. But when you, and, and they like to, uh, ha you know, hang on to this thing that they call priest-penitent, uh, privilege, which, as Alex pointed out in England, there's no such thing. But if you mm. think about it, if a Catholic goes to confession, that Catholic has a has a pre, a kind of a a, a predestined idea uh, that what he's saying is between himself, the priest, and God. That's as far as it goes. The Catholic parishioner doesn't think, oh, there's a camera in there. Doesn't think. Um, you know, it's being written down and it's going to be potentially distributed to the number of people Karen mentioned, 160 of people, right? But Scientology claims that same privilege, but while, you know, not keeping it, you know, what I think the expectation of pre a privilege is it's just between you and the person that you told, and that's it, period. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, note Jane Doe's comment. Um, some of that absurd contract junk must be enforceable. If we were out in the secular world, unenforceable. Yes, how, unenforceable. I, 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 Not I'm, enforceable. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Some of that absurd contract junk must be unenforceable. If we were out in the secular world, yes. However, under the First Amendment, the state may not make any rulings concerning religion. So mm -hmm. with religious contracts, you're you're in a different part of the law where you can sign absurd religious contracts. And mm -hmm. in fact, they're only tested when they go to court. Mm -hmm. 
So for example, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses with not wanting blood transfusions. As an adult Jehovah's Witness, you can reject a blood transfusion. Now, however, if you refuse it for your adult child, there have been cases where the parents have been charged with manslaughter mm. or murder. Right. So when it comes to religion uh, in America, things are very, very enforceable. That's why these Scientology is fighting to keep everything in binding arbitration in their on their which is a kangaroo court. It's a sham. But yeah. so we're, that's the problem is fighting the beast that is First Amendment protection. Right. I think that links through. I was going to. Uh, I can hear howling. Yes, we have a Halloween Borzoi chorus. It should end. Um, I was going to say. Go I was going to say. <laughs> sure. Um, I'll take you out while, until you come back. Um, we're coming up. We've gone over an hour, so I'm thinking now might be a good time to start looking at um, some of the questions if you guys are up for that. Um, and Jeffrey's last point about the enforceability of the contracts actually links to one of the questions that I found, which says from Born Ancient, question, how do personal record folders held by the cult stand legally within the UK's GDPR legislation? And it's such a good point. Um, for those of you watching, GDPR is the Global Data Protection legis like ruling or something. Um, essentially, it's um, a European law that applies to not just companies based in Europe and the UK, but any company that operates or holds your data in the UK and Europe has to abide by these rules. Essentially, it gives you as a person the right to your own data. So you have the right to request a copy mm -hmm. of any and all data an organization has of you. That includes CCTV. That could be, you know, ethics files and your PC folder. And that is not something that can be overturned or signed away in a contract. It is a, a, a right in the in the UK and Europe. So in answer to your question, uh, if they've got a PC folder uh, about like, your PC folder and you request mm. it through GDPR, they are legislated to have to give that to you, wow. even though you may have signed something that mm. says, you know, mm. I don't want to see it because it's, your data is your right under GDPR. Yeah, and I just want to add to that that while the Church of Scientology, the, the Scientology enterprise, sees that as a kind of suppression against them, the reason that, that got passed, as it's my understanding, is especially in Europe and UK, they were very uh, sensitive to what fascist and autocratic organizations look like. And one of the first things they do is they gather intense amounts of detail on their members. So in Europe and the UK, they said, you know, we're not going to let fascism raise its ugly, rear its ugly head again. We're going to put a stop to that. And they ran, the Church of Scientology ran straight into that with their yes. data gathering uh, deal, you know, their, their data gathering uh, the, the obsession. Absolutely. Um Here's another one, Super Chat. Thank you, Mervolima80, for the Super Chat. Thanks for all you're doing. I appreciate that. I think we all do. That's uh, nice that we've got the support of the community, right? Um, so look, there's a question for me that's kind of interesting. Sure, go for it. Uh, well, I can't put it up because... Oh, there it is. Uh, how was I able to not sign a secret contract? I don't know. I just... I got, I just would always pretend my hand was broken. And anyway, nobody ever tried to recruit me. I think because I had more value to David Miscavige, he could point to me and he could say, see, I had to hire somebody to do your job because you guys are such a bunch of idiots. So if I joined the circuit, you wouldn't be able to say that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is one of the lies that I wanted to bring up today, actually, PTS for Life. How do I contact Bob for my overdue big pharma check? This is the lie I think I'm probably most upset about. The church told me that if I became a suppressive person and spoke out against the church, I would be paid a giant check from the big pharmaceutical companies because the psychs are paying off the SPs. Well, I've very clearly been a suppressive person for several months now, and uh, I haven't received my check. Yeah, I can't believe the us. church lied to me about this. Where's my check? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I know. We all need our check. You know what's really amazing is that the number of people I've spoken to who, who are connected, who have a know somebody who's high up in 
in the psychiatric industry. Maybe they're an officer in the APA or something. And they ask them about Scientology. They're kind of like, who? Like Scientology makes this big deal about psychiatry. There's some psychiatrists that are mildly interested in Scientology because study because it's such a whack job uh, uh, a belief system. But most of them are like, Scientology? What is that? Yeah. They, but Scientology yeah, sure. would tell you that they have a major impact on psychology. Uh, may I share something fun before we, we go? Please. Sure. This is really fun. This gets into more of their, their legal stuff. And I'm going to share it. Now, this is pretty mind-blowing. If you're an OT, now, if you're an OT, you have to pay $100,000 financial fine if you talk about the OT levels or Xenu. That's why they won't talk about it. So here's a folder, yeah. uh, OT preps, OT eligibility, blah, 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 blah. Now, this contract, this is what you sign. Okay, so it says, uh, Prishner understands and acknowledges that the confidentiality of the advanced technology is to be maintained forever by flag service organization, by all other churches of Scientology and affiliated organizations, and by their respective parishioners and staff, including parishioner. That means you have to lock your OT materials in a briefcase, locked, and then you acknowledge it. Now, further, parishioner agrees to pay flag service organization as, and its licensor the total amount of $100,000 for each such breach by parishioner. So if you talk about the OT levels, that's $100,000 breach per occurrence. That's why Scientologists won't talk about it. That's why, you know, uh, when Tommy Davis was the spokesman, and uh, I think that fellow out of Palm Springs was interviewing him, and they were asking him about Xenu and Space Opera, and Tommy says, that sounds nonsensical. That doesn't make any sense to me. Does it make any sense to you? Yeah. He was lying, but that's why you, that's why OTs, there's a hundred thousand dollar and there's all kinds of contracts. There's a severance contract where you um, agree not to, to uh, blaspheme David Miscavige. which is, it's uh, a, a legal word. Uh, and I don't recall right now, but you agree not to deprecate any of the leading names of Scientology. So every, tr every course you take, you sign a contract with mm -hmm. every org you take. So that's that's how it shakes out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah one, two, three, everybody. Zenu, 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 Zenu. <laughs> that was 400 wow. grand right there. Even with the, that's a comment for you, Karen. The, the, the internet is just deluge, deluge. Hundreds of thousands of, com of comments on what these confidential Zenu volcano attach spirits exercising yeah. your body it's full of yeah. it they, they may have that contract and little scared little guys inside believe all that but once so many exit and it's just inundated there's no secret they've That's lost crazy. their secrecy to well, it yeah, i think I'm, i think i'm personally i'm very current Oh, I wanted to add one last final comment sure. on the introspection right now. You have to pay cash for this rundown. You have to yeah. pay. Mm. Come, they took off the hours of your hours on it. And if you sort of die or you incapacitated, they go to your relatives and bill them. You have to pay right. hard cash for locking <laughs> you in a room yeah. and asking yourself, it's cash. Follow the money. Scientology yeah. is I about mean, the cash, even when they lock you up. Yeah, I, you know, I just have to make a comment about this whole Zeno thing real quick. You know, Miscavige has been kind of famous for what I call mainstreaming things. Gold was a secret base, then everybody knew where it was. He's like, screw <laughs> it, we'll make a documentary about where it is. The meter was a big secret, and then everybody knew about it, so he said, screw it. Let's put it in an ad and show it on the Super Bowl. You know, you know, he's always like he'll take these things and put them in the mainstream. I think they should do the same thing with Zeno. They should put a statue of Zeno in all the churches, a big sign on the wall. They should do ads that say, hey, people are making fun of us. So this is what happened. Your body is infested and we can help you. I'm telling you, 
there's enough people out there that would buy that shit that they would probably have three or four times the membership that they do right now. I mean, just look at people buy into like the QAnon conspiracies and all this crazy stuff. Oh yeah, it's Mitch, very, I, I, yeah, I, I I've always thought that it's, out. yeah, I, I always thought they said, yeah, that's real. You, you know, because uh, uh, in, in the uh, Christian evangelical movement, Catholicism, uh, demonic possession is viewed as reality. Yeah, it's real. Yeah. I've always wondered why they don't go public and embrace it and say, yeah, that's I what know. really happened. They should stop running away from it. Should, I know. They should be selling you, it as, no, you don't understand. You guys are lean deluded into because it. You're, your yeah. BTs are telling you that, you, you know, you want to know why sometimes you're upset and... Sometimes you have weird thoughts. It's not your fault, people. There's a group of people that will fall right into that. Mm. Yeah, mm. true. Yeah, yeah somebody well, said like, here, Xenu Project said I shouldn't be giving them ideas. Don't worry about Xenu Project because I know how if they ever do that to completely take that apart. So we're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's pass through these last three comments. Nancy Ives, thank you for becoming a new channel member. Uh, Candy's Life has a comment for you, Karen, if you want to read this one out. Oh, you're so sweet, Candy. Thank <laughs> you for your kind words. I'm yeah. an old, old lady now. <laughs> Okay. And I think Beautiful. this is the perfect one to wrap it up on from, from earlier. Nermin Odkin says, Scientology, selling lies since 1950. Any yeah, final go. comments from you guys before we wrap up here? That's a bonus. No, I think, I, I think that um, I have the Introduction to Scientology Ethics <laughs> book. And according to my reading of it, we're, on, we're all in violation of Scientology ethics. And uh, it's probably lower conditions for us. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, yeah. without a doubt. I think, Alex, unless you yeah. go out on the streets tonight and sell at least a thousand copies of Dianetics, I think you're not going to get out of lowers. Anyway, well, yeah, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to go out and buy a dozen toothbrushes tonight because. And I'm just staying here parked across the, the bathroom. street. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm staying here parked across from uh, Pack Base, so I'll be here if yeah. you want to drop by. <laughs> okay. okay same time same place next week tuesday five o'clock pacific all four of us will be here and entertain and educate you for another episode all righty well thank you so much for joining us guys and thank you everyone and we will see you on the next one bye for now <laughs>